Hey everyone, welcome back to AP Biology Unit 5 Heredity. Let's get started. So as always, what are we going to cover? We will go through all of Unit 5 as posted by AP Central on the College Board website, and we'll go step by step through each unit. Okay, so the first unit is meiosis. What is meiosis? Well, it is meiosis is a form of cell division that produces gametes with a haploid number of chromosomes. Let's take a closer look at what that means. I know it's a mouthful. Gametes are sexual reproduction cells within male and females. They contain one half of the genetic data needed for reproduction. A diploid cell has the typical amount of DNA. It's, it is symbolized by 2N. Haploid cells, or gametes, contain half the genetic material needed. It's symbolized by N. Two haploid cells join to form a diploid cell, which replicate to form offspring. Both male and female produce the haploid gametes, which later join, when mating, to form a diploid cell. For example, the male sperm and the female egg are gametes that join to form the fertilized egg, or a, which is a diploid cell. Okay, so now let's go over the process of meiosis. Since we're trying to get um, a haploid cell, the process is divided into meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. So the first process is my, of meiosis 1 is prophase 1. Since the cell has four angenetic material from synthesis in the last phase, it contains chromosomes that code for the same thing. Uh, these doubles are called homologous chromosomes or homologs. These copies proceed to match with each other. Also, the nuclear membrane begins to break down, as you can see by the dotted line. Lastly, in prophase 1, the crossing over occurs when homologous chromosomes pair together. They can cross over or switch areas of the gene. The location of the swap is called a chiasma. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner, the two chromosomes are crossing, and where those uh, legs intersect is the chiasma. This crossing over leads to the genetic diversity we'll have to talk about in the next unit. So, as you can see here, the crossing over and the um, genetic material from the blue chromosome goes over to the red chromosome. And since they code for the same thing, it's all good. Okay, so next is metaphase 1. Now we see the chromosomes line up at the metaphase plate in the center of the cell. Also, the spindles attach to the kinetic cores of the chromosome, shown by this arrow, or centers. The spindles attach to each other and the cell membrane for stabili stability during this process. On to anaphase 1. In this stage, uh, the spindles start to contract and the sister chromatids, chromatids are separated from each other. They begin to move towards the poles. In telophase, they have moved all the way to the poles. Finally, is cytokinesis, <laughs> cytokinesis in which a cleavage furrow forms at the center of the cell and sort of pinches the cell in two. Now we are left with two diploid cells with 2n genetic data each, but remember, we need to get to 1n, so meiosis 2 will start to take place. In meiosis 2, um, all the steps are exactly the same, except there is no pairing of the homologous chromosomes. Why? Because there is no duplicate DNA anymore like there was with the 4n beginning cell. So, the entire process repeats, and finally, we are left with 4n gametes. Okay, so next is 5.2, meiosis and genetic diversity. So remember how I told you we'll have to talk about the crossing over later? Well, now we talk about it. So first off is independent assortment. In this case, chromosomes can line up any which way at the metaphase plate. This randomness leads to genetic diversity as there's many combinations of chromosomes that can end up in the gametes. It all depends on where the spindles attach to the chromosomes and how the chromosomes are aligned at the plate. And as you can see here, this the gamete, let me get my laser pointer out. The gamete over here has actually blue and purple, and the green and red on the other one, while this one has blue and green, and purple and red, all due to the alignment of these chromosomes. Alright, so second is random fertilization. In this case, any of the millions of male gametes, known as sperm, could fertilize the egg. This is another chance process, since each sperm has a somewhat unique combination of chrom chromosomes, this would lead to more, gen more genetic diversity. Finally is crossing over and recombination, which we referred to earlier. New arrangements lead to different DNA com combinations and diversity. Okay, now we go to Mendelian genetics. So in these are, um, Gregor Mendel created multiple laws that explain heredity and the passing of traits. But first we must look at the basics of probability. So. When finding the probability of two independent events both happening, you multiply the probabilities of both events. For example, the probability of the next two children to be one boy and then one girl would be one half times one half, which equals one fourth. The keyword is and, which signals multiplication. 
When finding the probability of either one of two events happening, add the probability of each event. For example, the probability of the next child being a boy or girl is one half plus one half, which would be one. There would be a 100% chance of the next child being a boy or a girl, or is being the keyword signifying addition. Okay, now that you know that, uh, we have to cover some basic terminology. So first, um, alleles are one of two or more alternative forms of a gene. Hybrids are organisms carrying two different alleles for a trait. This is also known as heterozygote. Homozygotes carry the same allele, either two dominants or two recessives. We'll go over what a dominant and a recessive gene mean soon. The genotype is the actual alleles, while the phenotype is the physical trait that results from that allele. In Gregor Mendel's crosses, he actually formed, he named the parental generation P, the first filial generation, which is a cross between both the parental generations, and finally the second filial generation, which is just F1 crossed with itself. Okay, so let's go over the law of dominance. Sorry, one second. The law of dominance states that one allele is dominant, expressed, and one is recessive, not expressed. In this example, the capital G is the dominant trait, and the lowercase g is the recessive. If an organism has two dominant alleles, the dominant trait will be seen. If an organism has two recessive alleles, the recessive trait will be expressed. But if there is a hybrid or heterozygote, the dominant gene will mask the recessive, and its green trait will be expressed. The law of segregation states that during the formation of gametes, both parent alleles separate into those gametes. In this example, the offspring will has 50% chance of getting the recessive yellow gene or the dominant green gene from its parent. And then finally is the law of independent assortment. So this applies to crosses of two traits. It states two genes not on the same chromosome will segregate independently. So if the traits tall and yellow are on different chromosomes, um, then if the, <laughs> if the traits tall and yellow are on different chromosomes, then the, I, the idea that the yellow trait has been passed on the offspring will not affect the probability that it will receive the tall genes. A dihybrid cross is a cross between two hybrids, as shown in the diagram. The outcome will always follow the 9331 pattern, where the probability of getting both dominant traits is 9 out of 16. The probab probability of getting a dominant and recessive tra trait is 3 out of 16, and a recessive trait and a dominant trait is also 3 out of 16. And then finally, the probability of getting both recessive traits is 1 out of 16. Finally, our back tests, backslash test crosses. We use these crosses to determine the genotype of an organism expressing the dominant phenotype. Since both capital B and lowercase b it exhibit the dominant phenotype, we cross it with the recessive organism and observe the offspring. If the dominant organism has the genotype capital B, capital B, then the offspring will all express the dominant phenotype because they are hybrids. And remember the law of dominance state that the dominant allele will mask the, the recessive one. However, if the organism in question is a hybrid, its offspring will express the dominant phenotype half the time, while it will display the recessive phenotype the other half. The crosses prove these to be true. This will help us determine whether or not the original uh, organism is, in fact, heterozygous or homozygous for dominant. Now on to non-Mendelian genetics. These are things that don't, qualo, that don't quite follow the Mendelian laws. I always seem to get these mixed up, so hopefully this clears this up. Incomplete dominance is where the, is the blending of traits. Basically, no trait is dominant over the other. In these cases, the genotype are different letters and are all capital. The genotype RR codes for the red trait, while WW codes for the white. The genotype RW will code for the blending of the two into pink. Codominance, on the other hand, leads to the appearance of both traits. Blood type is a perfect example of this. The A blood type contains its A markers and the B blood type contains the B markers. The combination leads the blood type AB which has both A and B markers, not a mixing of the two like it was in incomplete dominance. Another two I get mixed up is polygenic inheritance and multiple alleles. In polygenic inheritance, the phenotype is due to a blending of several separate genes along a continuum. The distribution of the phenotypes is shaped as a bell curve. Skin color is a great example of this. As the diagram shows, three genes, A, B, and C, code for skin color. The passing of either the recessive or dominant alleles for each of these traits changes the tone, skin tone each time. None is actually masking the other. 
Multiple alleles is when there's more than two allelic forms of that gene, like blood types A, B, AB, and O. It's different from polygenic inheritance because it only passes two genes. Last is gene interactions, uh, basically how genes can interact if they both are present. Polytropy is the ability of one gene to affect an organism in several ways, like the one gene controls eye and hair color. Epistasis ooh, sorry, is when two genes control one trait but mask the expression of the other. The masking gene is epistatic to the one it masks. Whew, okay, we're almost there. Now we are on to Unit 5.5, Environmental Effects on Phenotypes. Penetrance is a proportion of individuals in a group with a given phenotype that actually show the given phenotype, such as a disease. Much of the population may have the genotype for a disease, but only a select sample will actually get the disease. Expressivity is the degree to which a genotype is expressed in an individual. Finally, heritability is a factor that is expressed from 0 to 1, showing how much of the gene is contracted by genetics and environment. For example, if heredity, heritability is 0.65, then the trait is caused by 65% by its genes and 35% by the environment. Rabbit's fur, changes, rabbit's fur is a good example because it changes due to the temperature in that specific area of the body. It's just a cool way of how the environment affects expression. Alright, 5.6, chromosomal inheritance. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. 22 of these pairs are autosomes and code for the body, while the last one is the sex chromosomes, which establishes the gender. The pair XX for the sex chromosomes would be female and XY would be a male. A sex link mutation occurs on the sex chromosomes and is passed on that chromosome to its offspring. If the disease is dominant, then the female will express the disease. However, if it is recessive, if it is recessive then the mutation must be on both chromosomes for the female to express the disease. Males will always get the disease if it has a mutation, since they do not have a backup X chromosome. If the mutation is on the Y chromosome, the male will always get it and the female will never get it. Okay, so we can use recombination frequencies, which we'll learn how to calculate later, and crossing over rates to determine the position of genes. Genes farther apart are more likely to be separated due to crossing over. This makes sense because if they're far apart, they're more likely to get intertwined and therefore cross over. We use map units in which one map unit is is the distance in which recombination occurs 1% of the time. Let's work out this problem. If genes A, B, and D are linked, the crossover or recombination frequencies for B and D is 5%. B and A is 30%, and D and A is 25%. We start by plotting the farthest distances first. So we put A and B at the farthest ends, and since we know that D must be between these two, since its recombination frequency is under 30, we know we must place it inside the A to B range. It would be placed as shown. We can calculate the frequencies by dividing the number of recombinants by the total number of offspring and then multiplying it by 100. And then we use these recombination frequencies later to make our gene mapping. Okay. Alright, so on to some chromosome mutations. So a deletion is when fragments lost during division. An inversion is when a fragment reattaches to the original chromosome, but in reverse. Translocation is when fragments attach to a non-homologous chromosome. Uh, polyploidy is when this, when cells have an extra set of chromosomes. Non-disjunction non occurs when homologous chromosomes fail to separate. And aneuploidy is when a cell has an abnormal number of chromosomes. Genomic imprinting refers to the alteration of gene expression due to the parent it's from. Some are methylated from one parent, resulting in the expression or uh, suppression of a gene. They're located on autosomes. Finally, extranuclear genes are genes that are found in places other than the nucleus, like the mitochondria. Mitochondrian DNA is only passed from mother to child, so it's actually used to track evolution and heritage. And here's a great picture showing all of these. Okay guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like it. If you found this helpful, please subscribe and like. Hope I see you soon.